Fox News host Tucker Carlson missed his Thursday night show after he went to the hospital with appendicitis. Ed Henry took over the 8 p.m. show, which went ahead and aired Carlson's interview with Frank Warmbier, father of the released North Korean detainee Otto Warmbier. Carlson had a fever, and his doctor urged him to go to the hospital, where he was diagnosed with appendicitis, Mediate reported. The condition, which can lead to death if not treated in time, usually requires the inflamed appendix to be surgically removed. A Fox News spokesperson confirmed the medical emergency and said, Tucker is now being treated for appendicitis. He is in good spirits and expects to back on the air soon. Dana Perino will take over for Tucker on Friday night. On Friday morning, Tapper tweeted, Get well soon to at Tucker Carlson, hoping for a speedy recovery. While some Twitter users credited Tapper for being classy, others were happy to use it as an opportunity to knock the Fox News host. Carlson's pre taped interview with Fred Warmbier aired on Thursday, even though the host was in the hospital. In it, Warmbier said, They are brutal. There's no sense to anything here. They've crossed a line with my son, Otto. He added, Otto was terrorized and brutalized for 18 months by a pariah regime in North Korea. We are thrilled to have him home. He's with his family. His mom is with him right now, and I'll be with him later today. At a Thursday afternoon press conference, doctors at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center revealed that much of the 22-year-old's brain has died, leaving him without the ability to speak, understand language or even move, besides the occasional fluttering of his eyelids. The doctors appeared to refute the North Korean regime's account that Warmbier went into a coma after getting botulism a day after he was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for stealing a poster during a visit to the Hermit State. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Sunday, the Sunday after the presidential election, I was at Dadeland Mall. I was in the parking lot of Dadeland Mall. And I called President-elect Trump on his cell phone to congratulate him on his victory. And one of the first things he said to me is, what are we going to do to help the Cuban people? A few weeks later, I had the honor of flying with him to Central Florida on Air Force One. And he again, in the midst of that conversation, asked, what are we going to do to help the Cuban people? My wife and I had the opportunity to dine with him and the First Lady in the White House. And in the middle of that conversation, he asked, what are we going to do to help the Cuban people and the people of Venezuela who are also living under a dictatorship? <laughs> Six weeks ago in the Oval Office, the President of the United States, gathered with members of his cabinet, made a very clear decision. We are going to do whatever it takes to empower the Cuban people so that they can be free and live in a democracy and have economic and political liberties that they deserve like everyone else in this hemisphere deserves. And he has not faltered in that commitment. The cooperation, the hard work, the commitment that this White House and that President Trump has shown to this cause I believe has no precedent, certainly in the modern history of this great cause. We have been helped by many who have aligned with us, some who could not be here today. I do want to recognize Resident Commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez of Puerto Rico, nuestra hermana de la isla de Puerto Rico que está junto con nosotros, that's who's with us on this issue. But what I want you to know is that in every single one of those instances in which the President spoke about Cuba, he also spoke about Brigade 2506. Because a few weeks before the election, for the first time in decades, he went to visit their museum, where they endorsed him, meaning the first time in decades that they had endorsed a presidential candidate. And there isn't a single time that I have spoken to the president about Cuba that he has not mentioned the brigade. And that strikes me because it reminds us that almost 60 years ago, when they were young men willing to fight and to die for the freedom of their homeland, 
They made an extraordinary sacrifice. And perhaps some of them felt that the time to make a difference for them had passed. But I want them to know that almost 60 years later, they have made a difference. That meeting and their efforts, I believe as much as anything else, has brought us to this day. And we just landed at the airport. I had the honor, again, of flying on Air Force One. They have the best M&Ms on the planet. <laughs> and you can take red lights when you're part of the motorcade that comes in, legally, without those crazy cameras. Never mind, I don't want to talk about that. But that, uh, get rid of the cameras, yeah. And, uh, and um, it struck me as, we, as the plane landed and we were getting into the cars that brought us here and we look at the president coming down the steps, he was greeted by dissidents, by freedom fighters, by people, some of whom on the island of Cuba have suffered greatly in the hands of this repressive regime. And less than a year and a half ago, an American president landed in Havana, greeted by a regime. A year and a half ago, a president, an American president, landed in Havana to outstretch his hand to a regime. Today, a new president lands in Miami to reach out his hand to the people of Cuba. And I close with this. I close with this. Many will characterize this as an effort to punish the Cuban regime. And it will punish the Cuban military that oppresses its people and helps Maduro oppress their people in Venezuela. But more than anything else, this change empowers the people of Cuba. Not the government, not the regime, but the people. So that they can enjoy the freedom and the liberty. With a very clear message, America is prepared to outstretch its hand and work with the people of Cuba, but we will not, we will not empower their oppressors. And you mark my words. And you mark my words. Whether it's in six months or six years, Cuba will be free. And when it is, and when it is, and when it is, I believe that the people on the island and history will say, that perhaps the key moment in that transition began on this day here in this theater with each of you and with a president that was willing to do what needed to be done so that freedom and liberty returns to the enslaved island of Cuba. Voy a ser bien breve, voy a ser bien breve, que es muy difícil para un cubano y para un senador ser breve, pero lo voy a hacer, porque quiero mandarle un mensaje al pueblo de Cuba. Y este es el mensaje. Que antes teníamos un presidente que le daba la mano al régimen que lo oprime, pero ahora tenemos un presidente americano que le da la mano a ustedes, el pueblo cubano. Que los días que los días en cual la política exterior de este país ayuda al régimen se están terminando y los días en que la política norteamericana ayuda al pueblo cubano para que ellos puedan tener la libertad, la democracia y los derechos que se merecen, que Dios, que Dios le ha dado. Y cuando ese, día, cuando ese día llegue, que Cuba será libre por fin, 
Yo le aseguro que ese día, que este día que estamos aquí hoy, la historia va a decir que es el principio del fin de este régimen. Gracias a un presidente llamado Donald Trump que hizo lo que tenía que hacer para que la democracia y la libertad regrese a la isla de Cuba. Muchísimas gracias. God bless you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the governor.